Today, um, when I talked about JavaScript briefly last week, one of the things I mentioned is the transition to uh, version 6, ES6 for ECMAScript, is largely complete. We haven't really updated the course materials to reflect that, and there's a lot of changes in ES6. That being said, though, a lot of things about the fundamental way you think of the programming model associated with JavaScript hasn't really changed. So, and the way that JavaScript interacts with the browser in particular, if you're doing browser-based apps, has not really changed. So a lot of the basic stuff we're going to talk about, even if you find yourself using JavaScript frameworks, which we're not going to have too much time to talk about, the underlying concepts are going to be really important. So we're going to talk about basically what are the moving parts that are involved, uh, whether you're doing a standalone mobile app using something like React Native, or whether you're doing a web-based app uh, with or without a framework, um, what's the sort of programming model that allows these rich experiences to, be, to work and to be coded in JavaScript? Uh, what are the minimal set of concepts that explain how this works? So what are the sort of, what's the basic machinery in JavaScript that lets this happen? And how is that maybe different from other languages you may be familiar with if you haven't done a lot of JavaScript programming? Um, and uh, Thursday or possibly Tuesday, I will try to talk a little bit about a few of the menagerie of JavaScript frameworks out there and give some guidance about what makes each one different and when you might think of using one over another and stuff like that. Um, but let me, uh, just as a random poll, um, I, I'm interested in, in having a sense of like how much JavaScript programming people have already done. So I, I don't have like a prepared multiple choice question on it. But if you could use your clicker, and we're going to use the following scale. A means you've basically never written any JavaScript. Like maybe you've seen some, but you know, you would not call yourself a JavaScript programmer. Um, B is you've done like some simple stuff, maybe because you've copy pasted from other sites to get something to work on yours. Uh, C is you're pretty comfortable with it. And D is like you have done a lot of JavaScript. Maybe you've even done server side JavaScript. So if A is almost nothing at all, and D is you think of yourself as pretty proficient and like you could help someone else learn JavaScript, uh, rate yourself on that axis. And I'm just sort of, and I'll, I'll verbally tell you guys what the results are, uh, but I'm just curious uh, so I can target the discussion. And also, I take this poll every year, and I like to you know, sort of get a sense of how the numbers evolve. Uh, okay. Anybody not voted yet? Um, but uh, So 77 people reporting back. And here is a rough estimate of how you're all rating yourselves. Uh, one person chose E, and I'm guessing that person means I could teach a course on JavaScript right now. Uh, oh, sorry, that person just uh, changed their vote. <laughs> By the way, that would have been fine. I'd be like, come on up, let's do it. Um, it's not my strongest language, I'll tell you that. Uh, okay, here is what, here's how you have self-evaluated. So uh, A is you know, very little to no exposure. B is you, you've seen some, and you, kinda, you can play around with it. You could probably get it to work if you had to. C is you've done a reasonable amount, and D is you think of yourself as very comfortable with it. So I, I hope that the C and D column folks, uh, when the time comes, will help out your column A and column B peers um, who are uh, needing some help with this maybe on their projects. So you know, bonus points if, if, you have, uh, if there's teams that are struggling with JavaScript-related things in their project and you answer their questions on Piazza and it's helpful, uh, philanthropy points are always good. So. OK, well, thank you for letting me conduct that little poll. It gives me a, a sense of um, everybody's expertise level. So with that in mind, um, and I don't know why this thing kind of sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, but um, JavaScript has a sort of privileged position because it's in the browser. Uh, and by the way, trivia fact, the, the language that was supposed to be in the browser uh, originally was supposed to be Scheme. It wasn't supposed to be JavaScript at all. Um, and the, uh, the thought was, well, you know, Scheme is like people in the real world, normal programmers don't use Lisp. They don't understand it. It looks weird. Can we have something whose syntax kind of looks more like an imperative language, like, you know, C or, or even Java? And the syntax does look like that, but it's misleading because actually, the, as we'll see, the fundamental abstractions and the mechanisms, the way you think about JavaScript programming really comes much more from those other three languages, from Smalltalk, from Self, and from Lisp, none of which are traditional object-oriented imperative languages. So the syntax superficially looks that way, but don't let that fool you, because that's not how you think about the problem, uh, how about the programming in JavaScript. Uh, but for better or worse, it is the language in the browser. So that means that unlike any other language, 
It can be triggered by user-initiated events that happen in the browser, so the user clicks on stuff. It can also cause such actions to be triggered. So uh, just as it can be triggered if the user you know, clicks on a button, it can also essentially cause the button to be clicked even without the user having done it. Right? So it goes both ways. Uh, as we mentioned, after the addition of XML HTTP request, JavaScript acquired the ability via the browser to make a request to the server without uh, automatically causing the content that's returned to make the page be redrawn. So it could make a request to the server, it could just get whatever kind of data back, and it could do anything it wants with that data. Uh, in fact, when the data comes back, JavaScript will wake up and be told, here's the response to the request that you asked for. And among other things, it can use that data to make changes to the current document, which could cause a change in the way the document is displayed. Uh, it could examine uh, what the content of the document is. So this is kind of the privileged position it's in. It's the only language that gives us the ability to do this stuff. Um, and today we're going to finish. <laughs> finish. If uh, I could talk about JavaScript for like three weeks, but since we haven't had that much time, and this course keeps assuming more and more material until it bursts at the seams, um, as usual, what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of what the world of jQuery and Ajax is like. How do you think about testing in that world? Uh, we're you know, not really going to have time to do detailed examples, although I will say that there are detailed examples in the book with GitHub code, on, uh, uh, GitHub gist containing the code, and all the usual stuff. So <clears throat> when we last left off talking about JavaScript, I had made reference to this idea of the document object model, or DOM, which is basically a large data structure in memory in the browser that is the representation of the thing being displayed, the entire page. Uh, so the DOM itself is just a data structure. You have to think of it in an abstract sense. It is not a JavaScript thing, but via the JavaScript API, most browsers provide, well, all browsers now provide access to the DOM data. So we say that it has JavaScript bindings, right? But there, it, in, in no sense is the DOM actually a JavaScript entity. Uh, we mentioned that JavaScript can, by using that API, inspect the values of elements, including user entered values. So it can ask things like whether a checkbox is checked or not, what, uh, what the actual content of a text field is if the user has typed something in, into it. Uh, you can also make changes to the DOM, which have the side effect of causing what is displayed to change. You can remove elements from the DOM. You can temporarily hide them. You can uh, change their appearance in various ways. You can disable them so that some controls no longer respond to user inputs. There are a number of issues <clears throat> historically where the DOM has not been implemented the exact same way across all browsers. So it used to be a much bigger headache than it is now because you'd have to sort of test your JavaScript code independently on many different browsers to make sure you hadn't broken anything. These days, frameworks including jQuery take care of 99% of, of that for you. So um, basically, if you're writing simple JavaScript, there's sort of no good reason not to use jQuery. On Tuesday, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, heavier weight frameworks. If you're thinking of learning Angular or Backbone or React, uh, you know, what, those go quite a bit beyond what jQuery does. So from this point of view, JavaScript is just another language. There's no reason you couldn't have bindings to the DOM from something else, but JavaScript is what was chosen for the browser. So the JS API, generally speaking, is the name given to the way that the browser makes various things available to you via JavaScript. And remember that JavaScript is single-threaded, so anything we do in the browser, uh, any JavaScript that runs in the context of browser pages, has to not block for extended periods of time, because that is the only thing that is serving the UI thread. The, right? the user will perceive the browser page's UI to have frozen if the JavaScript blocks. So uh, what does the low-level JavaScript API look like? All browsers have a very basic level of a handful of methods built in that are sort of your, your way to reach into the document object model. And probably the best known is get element by ID. Uh, if uh, you, you probably may remember from Tuesday that when there's no qualifier in front of a variable name, it is assumed to be a property of this, and that in global scope, this is a, uh, an ob a JavaScript object representing the current window. So basically, we're saying in the current window, whatever the document is, uh, the document has a function value property that, given a string, it will return the JavaScript representation of the DOM element ID that, uh, or the DOM whose element has that ID if one exists. Um, and again, when I say the JavaScript representation, remember the DOM itself is abstract, right? So you're being handed a JavaScript object whose properties, whose slots, correspond to, for example, properties like what attributes does this element have? Um, 
if it's uh, something like a text field, does it have a value? Like, does it have text that was typed into it? And the browser arranges that if you make modifications to those JavaScript objects, they get reflected into the DOM. But the thing you have is not the DOM. It's just a representation of it. So uh, you can also ask, you know, given an element, uh, tell me all of its child nodes. Because the entire HTML page is actually a single top-level element called HTML, you can, in theory, by being given just document, you can traverse all the way down. Right? But you almost never do that. You usually think, uh, use calls like get element by ID if you know what you're looking for. Most people no longer use, or I don't see any good reason to use just the low-level JS API and these calls. Instead, most people use a framework. For a while, Prototype and jQuery were sort of fighting it out. jQuery pretty much has won that battle. Um, so jQuery is a framework itself written in JavaScript that essentially acts as an intermediate layer. And besides the fact that it uh, fixes a lot of the incompatibilities across browsers, so the same jQuery code will behave pretty much the same way on all browsers that support it, it also adds a lot of useful higher level behaviors on top of the very basic low level JS API that I just showed an example of. And the basic idea of jQuery is that if you have a handle to a, a browser native DOM element, like the kind of thing that get element by ID might return, you can wrap that in a way that sort of gives it jQuery superpowers. It gives the uh, element a whole bunch of new behaviors and the ability to do other stuff to it that if you were doing in the low level API, you'd have to sort of manually write a lot of that code. So I'm going to give an overview of the way, you know, sort of the most common things that people tend to do with jQuery and how they do them. The most important single function is a top level function. So when you have your jQuery JavaScript tag, it adds a single thing to the global namespace. Remember, this is a, a JavaScript best practice, right? Add one object to the global namespace, and the properties or, or method calls associated with that object encapsulate all of the data and functions of the app. So in this case, uh, the top level name that jQuery defines is jQuery. And at, uh, because dollar is actually a legal JavaScript variable name, jQuery alias itself as dollar, which used to be a big mess because prototype also used to alias itself as dollar. And if you inadvertently loaded both, uh, badness would happen. Uh, but when you see dollar paren all over the place, that's what it is. Dollar is just an alias for this, uh, which has various ways that you can call it. It's a function, and it's polymorphic, meaning that the way you specify the arguments determines what it does. So, let us look at a couple of the behaviors that it has. Um, the most common behavior you see is you use it to select elements. So if I have an, an expression like this, which again is just a shorthand for jQuery uh, and calling the jQuery function with the string, this will return zero or more elements uh, in, in an enumerable collection form that match whatever this CSS specification is. So anything that is legal CSS can go here and you can have arbitrarily complicated expressions. What can you do with the return value of that? Uh, well, one thing you can do is you can call each. And just like in Ruby, when you call each, you're just providing a function saying, here's what to do on each of them. Um, anytime you have a, a method that or a function that returns a DOM element, if you just wrap it by calling dollar sign on it or calling jQuery on it, it becomes the sort of jQuery superpower enabled version of that element. So it, you know, it's a button on a form. It is a particular paragraph of text. The thing the browser gives you back is a low-level representation of the element. If you just call dollar on that thing, you have sort of endowed it with the secret jQuery powers. And I'll show you on the next slide a few, what a few of those powers are. The second thing you can do with the dollar call is you can create elements. So here, uh, the return value of it, what I'm doing is passing some raw HTML. And that HTML is going to be used to create this element um, and uh, at that point, I can decide where to insert the element in the DOM tree, right? So now think of it as I'm holding a tree node. That's what else is going to turn out to be. And I'll show you some calls on the next slide where you can say, insert this node as a child of this other node in the DOM tree, for example. Uh, almost all jQuery calls also return the element that they operate on. So for example, if I have asked jQuery to return to me the element or elements whose ID matches movies, and of course, if it's a well-formed page, there should be at most one such element. Um, and then I say, give, for all of the elements that match this, add the CSS class main. And this call essentially returns the same thing that it was called on, if that makes sense. So basically, I can now continue to call additional functions. And every one of them is going to operate on that same return value. So a very common idiom in jQuery is you grab an element, or maybe you create an element. And then you do a whole bunch of things to it just by chaining the calls together. 
Um, and then the third thing you can do, or a third thing you can do, is if you remember Tuesday, we talked about this idea of passing a function to be called when the browser decides the page has finished loading. Uh, the browser has a native hook for doing that, uh, which is the onReady hook. But if you use jQuery's onReady hook, jQuery also has its own functions that it runs when the page is loaded. And this will allow your function to sort of uh, get in the queue and be a first class citizen along with them. So remember that this dollar function is polymorphic because the way you call it, the kind of thing you pass as an argument, determines what its behavior is. If what you pass looks like a CSS selector, then its behavior is to return all matching elements. If what you pass looks like raw HTML, then the behavior is create a DOM node containing that HTML and return the jQuery representation of the node. Uh, and if the argument that you pass looks like a function object, it means add that function to the list of things to run when ready. What can you do with jQuery superpowers? Here's a handful of things, but to give you a sense, to give you a flavor of what you can do, um, you can ask an element if it has a certain condition. Like if it's a checkbox, you can ask if it's checked or selected. Uh, you can ask if a button is enabled or disabled. And notice how the strings were chosen by the designers of the jQuery library to look like the Ruby symbols. Right? JavaScript doesn't have symbols at all, but because if uh, the Rubyistic way to do this would be to sort of declare an enumerable type that has a fixed number of values, the jQuery designers chose to sort of make it look like that. You can, uh, on an element or a collection of elements, you can add or remove CSS classes, or you can ask whether it currently has a CSS class. So, you know, a standard kind of trick you would use this for is if there's a particular uh, div or, you know, panel on the screen that is supposed to represent a message to the user, and the message is trying to tell them something really bad happened, you could add a class to that div to make the message show up, you know, in red or something rather than the usual color. Or, jQuery defines some pseudo classes for you to, to hide elements. So if you add a class called hidden, it will actually make the element temporarily go away. It's still in the DOM tree, it's just not visible on the page. So those are the kinds of things you can do. You can ask for or change the HTML or text value of the element. So you can change the actual text content. Um, you can set specific attributes. Uh, you can make elements appear or disappear. You can fade them out. You can slide them up and down. You can animate them, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So all of these things are things you can do on the jQuery superpower enriched version of the element. You can't really do them on the element itself uh, because that's kind of what jQuery is giving you. So this table is taken from the book, but the jQuery documentation is fairly easy to navigate and it's got the complete list. I just kind of chose some of the most commonly used ones.